Hey guys, how you doing? Um, I did, I was over in New Zealand for the last week over there on holiday with the wife and um, did a little bit of training and teaching at my at a jiu-jitsu academy in my hometown. Um, shout out to Knights MMA in Timaru because it was awesome um, being able to train with you guys. Anyway, <clears throat> so something came up. I gave her like a little speech about improvement and one of the things that I see that inhibits um, improvement the most and that is trying to get your next belt. So it's really common that when people get their, for example, when people get their blue belt, like I always assume that you're just scraping by the bones of your butt, right? So like maybe let's say you've got like 80 techniques in your curriculum, right? 20 you're amazing at. The, mess, the rest you kind of average out. There might be some that you're not even very good at, but, you know, you managed to pass. Congratulations, you got your belt, right? Almost exclusively what tends to happen <clears throat> for when they get it is like literally Monday they turn up and they start looking at the purple belt curriculum immediately and everyone starts trying to reach and trying to move forwards to get that next belt. And I think it's a mistake. I think that the very you should spend at least the next year after getting your grade, like trying to perfect what it is that you've just left behind, the, the 60, 70% that you're average at, yeah? And the reason for that is, is if you do that, if you do the, the typical model and keep reaching all the time, by the time you hit black belt, 80% or 60% of what you're supposed to have been super good at or be able to understand at a level that you could teach it at, you haven't even really looked at it. And so many techniques get just discarded by lower grades because it's not working for them at the time. And so they just discard them in favor of something that does work because beating the person and winning is more important than learning. And they don't understand at the time how valuable um, a lot of that stuff is. So for example, um, I started the, 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 the class and it was a, it was a reasonably advanced class, you know, purples and, you know, browns and stuff like that there. And I said, okay, so who here bridge and rolled somebody off the mount last week? And who here double lapel choked somebody from the guard last week? Zero hands went up as always, right? Because they're typically techniques that just get discarded because early on we struggle with them, we don't really truly understand how they work, and we don't know how to make them work, which is which is even more common. We we could maybe demonstrate it, but we don't know how to get it from demonstrable to working in free training. So we kind of dis discard it because it goes into the too hard basket or it goes into the not advanced enough basket until maybe even decades later, you meet somebody who is just phenomenal at it, who can bridge and roll and double lapel choke black belts at will, and you're like, wow. Like, that could be me if I hadn't discarded that technique. Yeah, and so, I mean, I spend a huge amount of time teaching white belts because in my, my academy here, it's almost exclusively white belts because I'm basically starting with a brand new gym, right? It's a, two years old. We've got a couple of blue belts, um, a couple of purple belts who have joined from other schools and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's a, it's a beginner school, right? And if I go do seminars, if I go do um, classes at other gyms, I start right back at lesson number one because almost everybody ignores and discards all that sort of stuff. So I said to them, to help counter this, and I and I, well, I said, I told them a story about what happened with me, and my and it was and it's it's genuine, it's hundred percent true. The the Monday when I went to after I received my black belt over the weekend, and I cleaned the gym, I put my gear on, put my belt on, and I was walking across the room to open the door for the first time as a black belt in my own school, and. Um, of course, you feel a little bit different, you know, and treat people treat you really differently. Students I'd had for 
seven or eight years treated me very differently when I was wearing a black belt. But my, my mindset walking over to the door was that my job is to, to make all my students black belts. Yeah, to make them better than me. Not so much for me to be reaching forwards and I felt no obligation to like, because once you have a black belt, you're a black belt and you don't really, I mean, you might get given stuff, but like you're not fighting or, or climbing or reaching for, for a new belt in the same way that you are on the way up. And, and I often tell people that, that if you stop reaching, if you just focus on trying to get better, then belts come. Yeah, and I and I and I, I said to the guys in Timor, I said that everybody just give everybody a black belt. Yeah, day one, here's a black belt. Everyone's wearing black belts. The whole club's the same grade. There's no hierarchy. Okay, so stop reaching. You've all got your black belt. Let's just focus on getting better. I mean, we didn't do it. It was just a hypothetical situation, but I, it's just showing. It was just a demonstration and a and a way to think about like getting better as opposed to like trying to get the next belt. And, and everybody thinks that getting the next belt is getting better. It's not necessarily. You might be learning new techniques and be able to demonstrate new techniques, and you might even be beating people with those new techniques. But how much have you discarded behind you? How much have you left behind you that you're not super good at yet? Yeah, and I mean, we're all gonna have our favorite stuff. Like that's, that's inevitable, right? But discarding so much and accepting like a very low standard for some stuff, typically self-defense things or things that don't suit your body type, is going to rear up and bite you in the butt when you become a coach. Yeah. And even if you become a coach of purple belt or even blue belt, there's an obligation that you have to your, your white belt students behind you that you should know intimately their curriculum. And given that academies are like 90% white belts, you have an enormous obligation to know your white to blue curriculum perfectly as a coach. There should be no excuse for any mistakes or lack of knowing about it. And yet we tend to just move forwards all the time. So they've got an amazing culture in the gym down there. And I just said, look, you know, like you can learn from everybody. You know, and I would kind of almost encourage you to like flatten out the school, not do almost do away with the hierarchy and everybody learn from everybody else. Because there's blue belts out there and white belts out there doing amazing things if you watch them carefully enough. And we can learn, everybody can learn from everybody. So I think that chasing belts almost always leads to a degradation in your jiu-jitsu. Sure, it might be motivation for some, but I think it's going to come back and bite you. Um, what else came up? Um, yeah, that and, and I mean, just taking them through bridge and roll at a very high level and showing them like what they're missing and where most people go wrong. And the same for the double lapel choke. Like there's a lot of really simple, subtle movements and strategies. So for example... Um, whenever I'm teaching throwing, having done quite a bit of judo, um, and a lot of other different martial arts as well. I've done lots of different martial arts all my life, and they all have different ways of teaching, right? Some do like lots of high repetitions, some do lots of sparring, some do this, some do that. But um, I've, be, I've managed to be able to learn from each of them. And so where I, where I see a lot of people go wrong with um, throwing or application of or moving a technique even if it's an arm bar or a choke or whatever from a drilling situation to uh, its success in live sparring um, and now that there's this like a proliferation of um, like what's the term that they use um, where they're not they're not drilling they're just playing they're, they're setting games and parameters for games and, and they kind of roll and they don't do any drilling. That's becoming kind of popular now. Um, but what, you f what you'll find is that if you, even if you drill a throw a thousand times, like you understand that movement, 
but you know nothing about how to set it up. Yeah, and so it's the same as playing tennis. Like you can play a shot against a wall all day long perfectly. And then in a game, it's completely different. You're off balance, the person's moving, you're returning a shot from a weird angle, and then <clears throat> and then you're asking yourself to play that same shot. And there's a lot of adaptations that are gonna have to take place for you to be able to do that. So, um, so what I do when I teach throwing is um, I almost always show it as a setup, as always two techniques. So for example, if you're wanting to, to do a drop Sianagi, for example, then Koichigari to get the person to move their foot back so that it creates a hole, so you can see the hole, you drop into the hole, and you do the throw, right? So I teach everything as a combination when it comes to throwing so that people understand that <clears throat> they don't think that just by drilling this one movement, they're going to be able to do the throw. I mean, sure, maybe against somebody in the street who doesn't know what they're doing, that'll be fine. Yeah, you just do the technique. They don't know how to counter it. They're not an athlete or whatever, and it'll work. But when it comes to throwing in, in jiu-jitsu or judo, everything gets paired up. You always want to have a forward throw, a setup for the forward throw, and a rearward throw. And um, for example, that well, that was a perfect example, right? So using Kojigari, attacking their front foot to move the front foot back, that makes a hole that you can go into. Now they're going to fall over you when you do the throw. And Jiu-Jitsu is the same, yeah? So white to blue belt is primarily about, in my academy anyway, is primarily about knowing a single technique very well. I always talk about combinations and I often teach them in combinations, but the primary goal is to get very, very good at a particular technique, right? An arm bar, for example, right? So somebody in the street grabs your throat, you spin your hips and you can do the arm bar. Awesome. Now, blue belt onwards is Jiu-Jitsu versus Jiu-Jitsu at my academy, right? We've been focusing on street self-defense for the last couple of years, and now you get your blue belt. The blue belt test is incredibly hard, very physical, a lot of punching and kicking and hitting and real life scenarios. It's very, very difficult. Um, and then you move on to jiu-jitsu versus jiu-jitsu. When we're countering arm bars and we're countering triangles and we're looking at combination attacks, like when you go to do an arm bar, the person pulls their arm out, then you can switch to a triangle and things like that. So that that thinking there is really super applicable to throwing. Yeah, which is why I think a lot of jiu-jitsu guys have kind of avoided throwing for the longest time because they've drilled a throw and then they've gone to use it in a tournament and then it doesn't work or they get counted, which is really common. Because when you go to do the throw, you're on one foot, the other person's still on two feet. They just rotate you and put you on your back. That's super common for a Sotagari, for example. Um, and so they just, again, they discard something that doesn't work immediately before they know how to do it and deem it as unsuccessful. Whereas the reality is that you need to learn how to set it up, how to get the other person working for you and moving their body in a way that's going to be convivial or it's going to set up the environment that's going to allow you to do that throw. So another example, throwing wise, would be uh, Oichigari to Osotagari. So you go for Oichigari, they move their foot out of the way, they turn their body, which makes it perfect for you to be able to do an Osotagari because as they turn their body, they put their back facing where your front wants to go and that allows the throw to take place really easily. So that for me, for example, on, on the ground, I mean, and, and standing to a larger degree, um, is what I want to see for purple belt. So blue to purple is more about efficiency of movement and combination than it is being super good at a single technique. Yeah, so white to blue, I want to see single, single techniques done to a high degree, done very well. Composure under pressure is the motto for the belt. So you have to be able to make good decisions under pressure. I don't expect perfection. But when it comes to the live rolling and when we put gloves on and start punching and hitting people, then I expect them to be able to keep making good decisions even though they're exhausted and they can barely walk. Blue to purple, however, is more technical. I expect combinations. I expect efficiency and proficiency. And so that's, in my opinion, that's why purple belt is so dangerous 
even to brown and black belts because the, the, the main thing that makes you dangerous in jiu-jitsu is your ability to be able to fake and to be able to adapt and to be able to create combinations. So if something doesn't work, yeah, or maybe you've created the environment to give the other person the illusion that that's what you want, yeah. So I go for a choke, for example, the person pulls back and gives me their arm, okay? Or you could do it the other way. You go for the arm, they come down to close their elbows, and then you can put your hands in the collar and you can sink in chokes. So purple belt for me is a very, very heavy belt because you're taking forwards the main lesson that you need for black belt, which is adaptation, timing, combinations. Yeah. Anyway, long video, it's gonna take forever to load. Um, I just wanted to, 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 to voice this because it came up on the weekend. A lot of the little speeches I do are kind of spontaneous and stuff like that. Um, and everybody, a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said that it was really cool. So I thought I'll do a little video on that. So focus on getting better, not chasing the, the curriculum for the next belt. Perfect what you, you're supposed to have been super good at in your previous belt. Don't just accept your belt and go, great, I'm amazing. Let's get going to the next belt. Yeah, look backwards and go, right, I got my blue belt by the skin of my teeth. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And what can I, like, what did I kind of, Real, what did I hope the coach wasn't going to see that I was kind of like rusty at? And what are some things that I can really improve at before I go forwards? Anyway, that's my little speech from this morning. I hope you all are well. It's getting winter time over here. It's getting cold in Australia. And um, uh, I hope you guys are enjoying my videos. And uh, yeah, stay safe.